Hello everyone. Uh, today we want to take a look at a fairly common error that's made in electrostatic problems. <clears throat> I've seen it a few times, so let's take a look and see if we can prevent this happening in future. Let's say we have a positive charge of 300 microcoulombs and it is sitting some distance away from another positive charge of 500 microcoulombs and then there's a position somewhere down here call it z some distance away and the question we're being asked is what is the field at position Z. <clears throat> so uh, we know that uh, from Coulomb's law that the electric field due to a charge of Q is given by KQ over R squared, where R is the distance from the charge creating the field. So that's our basic equation we're going to be using. And the trick in this problem is how to combine the electric fields from these two charges uh, at the point Z. So let's put some dimensions on here. We'll say that this is 0 0.8 meters and that this is 0 0.6 meters. If you do the Pythagoras, you'll find that that means that the total distance from charge number two, let's label these one and two, is actually one meter. So we've got two distances and uh, we're all set to go. Now, uh, people start thinking about, okay, this second charge sitting over here, charge two, is acting at an angle on position Z. So I'm going to have to deal with some kind of components in the X and Y direction. So let's just put some axes on here. We'll call the horizontal distance X and the vertical axis Y. So at the location Z, we're going to have some X and Y components of the field coming from charge number one. And we'll need to combine those with the X and Y components of the field coming from charge number two. And here's where people get a bit confused. They start doing components of distance instead of components of field. And I'll just show you what I mean over here and then perhaps we can erase it. So let's just quickly redraw that. And remember this is going to be incorrect. So they say, here's my triangle. This is one, this is 0.8 and this is 0.6. And when looking at charge number two, they start thinking about the distance in the y direction and the distance in the x direction. So this would be y equals 0 0.6 and x equals 0 0.8. And they start thinking that the force or the field, I should say, can be broken down based on these two distances. So they write things like um, EY or EX is equal to KQ over 0 0.8 squared and EY equals KQ over 0 0.6 squared. 
so they're imagining that this total distance of one between point Z and charge number two can be broken down into its X and Y distances and that those distances can then be fed directly into Coulomb's law in order to obtain the X and Y components. And that simply is uh, not correct. And let me help you understand why. There's a couple of ways to think about it. Um, imagine for a second that I change my axes. So let's say this is point number one, and this is point number two, and here is my Z point. So let's suppose now that instead of having uh, X horizontally and X vertically, that I changed my axes to something a little stranger. Let's suppose I put my x-axis like this and my y-axis perpendicular like this. And so you can see now that what I've done by choosing a different x and y-axis is that I've made this x distance, or sorry, this y distance, forgive me, I've made this y distance very, very, very small. And in fact, I can make it as small as I want. And if I make it as small as I want, then my electric field in, in the y direction using this bad maths would just go out of control. KQ over, let's say I make it 0 0.0000001 and then I square that, clearly I can make my electric field in the y direction anything I want just by changing the angle of my axes for the calculation. And that can't, that can't be right. I hope you understand that. And we can't just have uh, fields, you know, field components arbitrarily large based on the axes we choose. So you cannot start breaking up the distance into x and y distances and plugging them into the Coulomb equation. You must find the total field using the direct distance between the charges. And then once you have the total field, then you can start uh, worrying about components. Another way to think about this particular error and let me do it in in red again so let's quickly sketch one more time one charge second charge point z down here and then the dotted lines to represent the bad components of distance. So let's call this distance here R. We have our X and Y axes. So this distance is X and this distance is Y. And Pythagoras tells us that R squared is equal to X squared plus y squared. Nothing wrong with that at all. You can break up the distance into its components in that fashion, no problem at all. Problem is when you start feeding them into Coulomb's equation. So let's write down what the, let's assume for now that the charges here are just one Coulomb and one Coulomb to make the, the math simple. If that was the case, then we would say that the electric field along the R direction would be K, Q1, 
which is uh, in this case, we're just dealing with the one charge divided by R squared. I realize I may have confused you there by putting a charge on this second charge on the left hand side. For the moment, we're just talking about the uh, the effect of the charge I've circled in orange, how it's producing a field at location Z. So for now, forget about the second charge up in the top left hand corner. So the electric field at Z due to this one Coulomb charge would be K over R squared. And now if we did that bad maths again, let's just go back to red. The bad maths says that the electric field in the X direction would be K over X squared and the field in the Y direction would be K over Y squared. And remember that that is wrong. I'm just writing this down because it's a an error that I keep seeing people make. So, um, so if, and I say if, if this was correct, if these were indeed the electric fields in the x direction and the y direction, then we should be able to combine them to get a field in the r direction. But let's see what happens. So I'm going to write down my EX acting this way and my EY acting this way. And together they should be producing ER. So now let's see what happens when we try to combine our EX and EY using Pythagoras. So this would mean that E R squared is equal to E X squared plus E Y squared. Fair enough. And now let's feed in the values and see what we get. So that would mean that K over R squared must be equal to K over X squared. These all squared, remember, plus k over y squared, all squared. And now uh, you can cancel the k's all the way across, and you're left with 1 over r squared, all squared is 1 over x squared squared. It's 1 over y squared squared, which gives you 1 over r to the fourth is equal to 1 over x to the fourth plus 1 over y to the fourth. And if you rearrange that equation, put the right hand side over a common denominator and then flick everything upside down, you will get r to the fourth is equal to x to the fourth y to the fourth over x to the fourth plus y to the fourth. And if you take the square root of both sides to get back to r squared, and let's just uh, Let's just do that over here to compare it to what we should get. So on the left hand side, we get R squared. And on the right hand side, we'll get X squared, Y squared on the top. And on the bottom, we get the square root of X to the fourth plus Y to the fourth which is clearly not the right answer. So that's a very long winded way of showing you that 
using the x and y components of the distance is actually not mathematically the correct thing to do. So <clears throat> I'm not sure which approach you prefer, whether this mathematical approach or whether the, the more simpler explanation that if you rotate the axes, you can see that uh, it gives you bizarre answers. But uh, both indicate that that is not the thing to do. So please don't do that. OK, let's do it the right way. So let's do this the correct way now, starting with charge number one. So we can say the field due to charge number one at location Z will be K times charge number one, which is 300 times 10 to the minus six coulombs, divided by the distance from location Z 0.6 squared. And now using k is 9 times 10 to the 9, 300 10 to the minus 6 divided by 0 0.36. Equals, pause for a second, do it on the calculator. That is 7.5 times 10 to the 6. And this is a field, so that's a force per charge, newtons per coulomb. So that is E1, the field due to charge number one at the point Z. Now we move on to E2, same equation, different charge this time, 500 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs, and the distance we're using is the full distance between charge number two and the point we're concerned about, which is F. That gives us 9 times 10 to the 9 times 500 times 10 to the minus 6. Which is 4.5 times 10 to the 6 newtons per coulomb. So now we have the, the two uh, components of the field operating on point Z. So let's just quickly do that. So here's, here's my point Z. And let's just see which direction these things are going in. So the field direction is the direction in which a positive test charge would move if you placed it at that point. So for E1, the charge one is positive, 300 microcoulombs, and that means a positive charge placed at Z would be pushed downwards. So E1 is acting downwards. Similarly, if we look at E2, that's being created by the positive 500 microcoulombs, and so a positive charge sitting at Z would be pushed away from charge number two in this direction, E2. OK, so those are the two fields combining together and acting at point Z. Let's choose some coordinates again. X is horizontal, Y is vertical. And now is the point where we have to try to combine these two electric fields into one single electric field. And that's where we need to choose the components. Now, electric field number one, E1, in the x direction, <clears throat> is zero. 
electric field vector one is pointing straight down, so straight in the y direction or the negative y direction. So its x component is zero. E one y, the y component of E one, well that's the whole of E one because E one is pointing in the y direction. So that's seven point five times ten to the six. Now we have to break up E2 into its X and Y components. How are we going to do that? Well, we need a bit of trigonometry. So let's quickly draw the triangle to figure out the angles that we're dealing with. This is just a miniature version of the triangle above. 0 0.8, 0 0.6, and our E2 is acting in that direction. So what angles can we get from this? Well, we should be able to get this angle theta in here. We can write the tangent of theta is the opposite divided by the adjacent. You use sine or cosine if you prefer. So let's just plug that into the calculator and see what we get. So that's 0 0.75, which means that theta is the inverse tangent, tan minus 1, of 0 0.75. And if we do that, we get. That gives us an angle of 36.87 degrees. <clears throat> so this angle theta up here is 36.87. Uh, we're looking for the angle between E1 and E2. So this, let me just do that in a different color. So we're looking for this light blue angle in here. So if we go up to the triangle, that is actually the angle on the other side of the triangle. So we just do 90 minus, and that will give us this angle, let's call it alpha. So alpha is equal to, uh, what is it, 53.13? I think. 53.13 degrees. And that allows us now to work out the x and the y components of E2. So let's do that. Go back to a white pen. So we'll make a little triangle here. And we can say that the electric field due to particle 2 in the x direction, that will be equal to this part of the triangle over here. That's the opposite side of the, of the triangle. And so that is equal to the hypotenuse E2 multiplied by the sine of 53.13. And E2 in the y direction will just be the cosine part. Cosine 53.13. So let's just clarify that. So this E2x is the length of this side, the x component of E2, and E2y is the side of the triangle. So there we have the two components, and now we can evaluate both of those, and we're nearly done. 
We know E2 is 4.5 times 10 to the 6, so this is equal to 4.5 times 10 to the 6 times a sine of 53.13. Pull out the calculator, calculate that. So that's 3.6. times 10 to the 6 newtons per coulomb in the x direction. And similarly in the y direction, 4.5 times 10 to the 6 times the cosine of 53.13 gives us 2.7 times 10 to the 6 newtons per coulomb. All right, so what have we done? We found out the total force or the total field caused by particle one at Z and by particle two at Z. We called those E1 and E2, these guys here. Those are the total fields. And then we have broken each of those fields into its X and Y components. And now that we have all of the X components and the Y components, we can go about uh, joining those together with vector addition to find the final resultant field at point Z. So let's start a uh, clean sheet to do that. So let's mark point Z. And let's look at the components of field that we've calculated. We have said that down in this direction we have got E1 Y and the magnitude of that is 7.5 times 10 to the minus 6 newtons per coulomb. We've also got acting in the same direction E2 Y and that is 3.6 times 10 to the 6 newtons per coulomb. I beg your pardon, there shouldn't be a minus sign there. There we go. And we've got only one x component, and we know it's acting in this direction. And it has a magnitude of 2.7 times 10 to the 6 newtons per coulomb. So now we're able to sum the components in each direction and find the resulting field. So I've got 2.7 times 10 to the 6 is my total acting in the negative x direction and my total acting in the y direction is the sum of E1y and E2y. So that gives me 11.1 times 10 to the 6 newtons per coulomb. So these are field vectors. We know how to do vector addition. We do tip to tail. So I'm going to take the 2.7 and on the end of it, I'm going to add the 11.1 times 10 to the 6. And so this diagonal here is the vector sum of the 2.7 pointing west and the 11.1 pointing south. So this is my net electric field. Now we can use Pythagoras. We can do a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And so e net squared, that's the hypotenuse of the triangle, 
is equal to 2.7 times 10 to the 6 squared plus 11.1 .1 times 10 to the 6 squared. And that, if you solve that, tells us that E net is equal to 1.14 times 10 to the 7 newtons per cooler. So that is the magnitude of the final electric field at the point Z caused by the two charges, number one and number two. We've got the magnitude. We can also find the direction if we go back to the back to the triangle over here, and we can also find the direction of this vector relative to the north direction. So the angle theta, let's just bring this over here. We can say that the tan of theta would be the opposite, 2.7 times 10 to the minus 6, plus 6, beg your pardon, over 11.1 .1 times 10 to the plus 6. And that tells us that theta is 10 minus 1 of 2.7 over 11.1. .1. And that gives us an angle of 13.67 degrees. And there you have it. That is the way to sum the electric fields or the electric forces due to an array of point charges. I hope that's useful. Thanks very much.